I had a good day today. Rained a little bit, but that was all right. Um, I, you know, I, I don't mind winter. I really don't. And I don't mind summer. It's just the transition between that when the ragweed is, is waving and, and allergies are going, wing, 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 wing. Um, that's, that's difficult sometimes, but um, uh, it is what it is. So praise God for that. Amen. Um, tonight, uh, in the time we have uh, tonight, I want to share with you some thoughts about purpose and um, uh, thoughts about um, calling and gifting and uh, the direction of your life. Um, this, this evening, I, I really want to focus on possibly the, the core of who you are. And I'm talking to every one of us tonight, myself included. I want to talk about the core, the very foundation of, of who we are. Um, Mark Twain is credited with this. I, I, there's a lot of things that, that they credit to Mark Twain that he didn't say. So I don't know whether he said this or not, but nonetheless, it's credited to him. Uh, there's two important days in your life. One day is the day you were born. And the second day is the day you discover why you were born. Why you were born. The destiny of your life. The purpose of your life. I, I, I want to say something this evening that without purpose, uh, we wander around aimlessly in this life. Um, without direction, without um, uh, knowing our giftings and our callings and, and, and our talents. We kind of wander around aimlessly. But to know your purpose is to be defined and purposeful, as it were. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about that tonight, finding your purpose in, in life and, and, and in the church and, and how all that relates. Um, someone once said to, 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 to find your purpose, you need to identify those things that you really care about. So let me ask you, you don't have to answer this evening, but what do you really, really care about in life? What, what is it that, that really uh, is a passion with you? Um, another thing is, what do you value? What do you value in life? Uh, what, what takes priority in, in, in your life, as it were? Uh, what really matters? Uh, and, and, and then thirdly, uh, which, which I added to this, what do people say about you when you're in their company? What do, some people say, well, man, you are so compassionate. Uh, dear, you, 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 you just have a gift of Whatever. Um, what do people say about you when, when you're talking to them and you're talking about your temperament and your characteristics and your uh, giftings and things of that nature? So um, the Greeks, uh, let's, let's begin. The Greeks uh, came up with four temperaments. And this was, this was uh, ancient Greek culture. They came up with four temperaments. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about these. But these, the Greeks said there were, these four characteristics are what people are born with. And, and they called them the caloric, you probably heard them before, caloric. A caloric person is a person that's very confident. You know people like that? Very assertive, very, they're very decisive. They know what they want. Uh, calorics are natural born leaders, you know, natural born leaders. Uh, then then the, the secondly, they said there's, there's this uh, uh, characteristic, this temperament called melancholy. And the melancholy is a temperament that's detail oriented, uh, very dependable. Uh, so so the, without spending a whole lot of time on these, just melancholy is very dependable, very detail-oriented. Thirdly, they said the sanguine is a person that uh, has a characteristic of being very sensitive, compassionate, very romantic. Uh, boy, marry a sanguine. Hallelujah. Uh, if you want to be romantic. Um, so th th that's a person. Do you know people like that? Um, and then fourthly, uh, the, the Greeks said that there's, there's a phlegmatic, which is naturally service oriented. They always want to help people. They're, they're, they influence their environment by cooperating with others and carrying out tasks. They ten, tend to be uh, calm and unemotional and easygoing and things of that nature. So we all know people like that. And you may fit into one of those categories. You may fit into one of those uh, easygoing, friendly type persons. You may fit into that a uh, person that may be a, a party goer, that loves a party, uh, a person that, that may be quick-tempered, a uh, person that may be strong-willed, person that's very independent. 
Um, sometimes, you know, Pastor Curtis has taught this many times. We, we look at these characteristics as, as animal traits. And by that, I mean uh, that uh, uh, some people are like lions, you know. Some people are, you know, they're very forthright. They're very, you know, when you ask them an opinion, they're going to give you their opinion. That's, that's what they do. And that's fine. Uh, there's the otter. The otter is very fun-loving. Let's have a party, you know. And they, otters make parties out of everything, you know. And um, uh, there's, the, there's, the, there's the beaver that's very diligent, very fact-finding, and, and, and uh, very detailed in what he or she uh, does. And uh, you may fit into one of those categories. And then there's, lastly, there's the golden retriever. And um, I'm more of a golden retriever. And a golden retriever wants everybody to be happy. Just be happy. Don't be upset. Just be happy. And a uh, golden retriever tries to love everybody. You know, it's like a golden retriever when you come home, just, you know, just uh, licking you and, and all over you. That's a golden retriever. So these personalities, uh, Penn State, did a uh, research study, and they found that, that children, even in, in very young, with a very young age, can display these temperaments. And when you know these temperaments, uh, you can gauge what that child, how that child will react in different situations and in different circumstances. So every one of us, every human being, is born with with talents and abilities and personality traits that just make us who we are. It's who we are. It's who we are. Um, growing up, I was very shy. Um, my, my dad, bless his heart, he, um, um, he said, maybe they, we ought to give him tap dancing lessons and maybe that'll bring him out of his shyness. Um, Nonetheless, it didn't bring me out of my shyness. But I was, I was very shy growing up as a, as a youngster, you know. And uh, that was just my personality. It was just who, Now, my brother, on the other hand, was very outgoing. He was very outgoing and uh, still very outgoing. Um, and I've kind of overcome some of that. But all of us have different personality traits. That's what I'm trying to say. All of us do. And uh, which, which, which really, uh, can, can, let me just sidebar for just a second, which... which really makes me pro-life. And here's why I'm pro-life. Because we, I'm pro-life because I think we are destroying poets and doctors and, 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 and leaders and writers and inventors. That's why I'm so pro-life. That we are, we are, we are destroying People that have, would have value, so much value in this world. Um, so, nonetheless, that's a little sidebar. But uh, so, if we are all born with certain tendencies, I, I think I gave you a scripture a couple of weeks ago. Train up a child in the way he should go, and the way he should go really means according to his bent or according to the giftings that God has placed in him, and these giftings are from God. They're from God, and, he, and God has placed these within us. He created me to be who I am. He created you to be who you are. Uh, you know, a lot of times when you're growing up as, as teenagers, you wonder, what am I, who, who am I? What am I supposed to do? I don't know who I am. God created you to be someone special. And uh, not only that, but, but if you're born again, are you born again this evening? Do you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior? If you're born again, God has also placed gifts and talents within you when you were born again. So not only do you have gifts, abilities, talents when you, at birth, but you have gifts, abilities, and talents at the new birth. At the new birth. I counted 21, and there are probably a lot more, but I counted 21 giftings that God has for us as born again believers. And um, uh, well, uh, let me give you a scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. In the New Living Translation, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Isn't that significant? 
A gift was given by God to us for this reason. So I could help you, Cindy. So I could help you. So I could help you, Paula. So I could help you, Courtney. So I could help you. A spiritual gift was given to us so that we could help each other. Let me give you another scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now you collectively are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And individually, you are members of it. Each with his own, listen to this, special purpose and function. Each of us. Now, now you might say to that, well, uh, Sheldon, that, um, that's okay for you. Uh, that's okay for Pastor Nathan. That's okay for, uh, you know, someone who, uh, you know, is active in the church. But I don't know. I don't know if God gave me anything. And I'm here to tell you tonight that he did. He did. He placed within you a special gifting and talent. You know, uh, Pastor Nathan, uh, several weeks ago, taught three or or four weeks, three weeks maybe, on stewarding your gift, stewarding your talent, and how valuable that was to make sure that you use what God has given you. And God has given you so much. some of the um, uh, giftings that we have, and I just, I just listed a couple of them. I'm not going to focus too much attention on, on some of them, but, but we, we will highlight uh, uh, later on in this teaching some things. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are nine spiritual gifts. They're called the charisma. Nine spiritual gifts, and you probably are aware, uh, aware and, and, and uh, you understand them, but, but let, me just, let me just highlight them for a moment. Um, there's a gift of wisdom, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. There's faith. There's healings, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. So there's nine gifts of the Spirit. Now, I personally believe that these nine gifts of the Spirit are available to you anytime you need them. Here's what I mean by that. There may be times when you will need a word of knowledge and you have it. There'll be times when you need a word of wisdom and you have it. There'll be times when you're at Walmart. I know none of you go to Walmart, but, but we do. Not in Greensburg because it's too crowded. But not, yeah. yeah, really. Uh, but you go to Walmart, there's, there's a lady behind you. She's hurting. She, she says, oh, my back hurts so bad. I'm telling you, the gift of healing is yours. If you just turn around and say, God, may I pray for you? Gifts of healings. So I personally believe that these nine gifts of the Spirit are available to all of you. When you say, I'm not mature enough to use them. The moment you got saved, you were mature enough to use them. The moment. Matter of fact, the moment you got saved, you could be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. You just didn't do it. But the moment you got saved. So these are gifts that can be used whenever you need them. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, talks about five ministry gifts. And I use my hand to when I talk about these five ministry gifts because it's, it's, it just helps me understand them. There's the apostle. It's the thumb. The thumb reaches every other gift very easily. Very easily. The, the apostle is kind of, the, 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 the thumb kind of holds everything together. The apostle kind of holds everything together. Okay? Then there's the prophet. The prophet is the finger that points. He's, the prophet is the, is, the, is the ministry gift that says, this is what the word says. He, he perceives God. He understands the word. He, he, and, and, he, and he points it out. And, he, and, and, and we have many prophets in the land. A prophet is not necessarily, a could be, but not necessarily someone who knows the future. But a prophet is someone who declares the word with authority. A prophet. And then there's the evangelist. The evangelist is the tallest finger because he's the, he's the, he's the, the, the man or the woman that, 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 that proclaims the gospel. He's very flamboyant. Uh, he is, uh, he's unashamed. He's, he gets out there. He, he says, matter of fact, the evangelist feels like everybody ought to be an evangelist. Everybody ought. But we're not all evangelists. 
We're not all all evangelists, but the evangelist feels like everybody needs to be an evangelist. He's just, he's just very flamboyant that way. Then there's the, there's the, the ring finger, which is the pastor. Do you know the Greeks felt that the reason we wear our wedding ring on this finger is because the Greeks felt that there was a line from this finger all the way to the heart. That's why we wear our wedding, ring, wedding rings on this finger. But the pastor has a heart for the people. He's a pastor. Um, and I, I know a lot of uh, men and, 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 and sometimes women that, that have a heart for, for their churches, heart for the people. And that's what a pastor does. He's compassionate. He's loving. Um, and can, can the pastor also be a prophet? Absolutely. Can the pastor also be an evangelist? Yes, he can. But his, but his primary gifting is that of pastor. And then there, the little finger is, is the teacher, is the teacher. Now, I feel like uh, that these, these five ministry gifts are, are callings. They're callings. I, you know, I, I was called to the pastorate. Uh, the prophet is called. The, the, the apostle is called by God. There was a time when I felt that the Holy Spirit uh, was, was urging me and calling me into the ministry. So these five ministry gifts are, are really callings. Uh, listen, the, the, the pastor or, the, or any of these, of these ministry gifts is, is not a job. It's, it's not a job. It's not an occupation. It's a calling. It's a calling. And uh, there are many people in the ministry today that possibly view it as an occupation. I don't. It is a calling of God. Uh, I could, listen, I could do nothing else in my life but pastor. <laughs> That's who God called me to be as a pastor. Okay? So uh, the five ministry gifts. Um, and and they, are, they are for a reason. These five ministry gifts are for a reason. To equip the people of God for service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. So these five ministry gifts are to mature the body of Christ. That is our job. That's what we're called to do. Now, moving along, there are motivational gifts. Um, the, The body of Christ is to function in a biblical manner. It's essential that the members of his body understand their function in the body and give themselves to perform that function. I say that in light of of these motivational gifts uh, that I'm going to talk about. Um, Let let me give you another scripture. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5 from the Passion Bible. In the human body, there are many parts and organs, each with a unique function. And so it is with the body of Christ. For though we are many, we're all mingled into one body in Christ. This means that all, we are all vitally joined to one another with each contributing to the other. So here's what that means. I need you and you need me. I want you to look at the person sitting right beside you. Look at them. If, they're not, if there's no one sitting beside you, look back or look in the front. You need that person. <laughs> well, <laughs> you need that person in your life. Because there may come a time when you need strengthened or you need encouraged. Or there may come a time when, you, when the prophet needs to take over and say, Be careful where you're going. We need each other. Husbands need wives. Wives need husbands. And the body of Christ needs each other. We sometimes feel like, you know, well, they wouldn't miss me if I if I wasn't here. We would miss you if you weren't here. Because we need you. Think about a chain, a link chain. If there's a link chain, if there's one link. That, that's not hooked up. What's that do to the chain? It unravels everything. So the body of Christ is a unit that needs each other to function properly. So in Romans chapter 12, there are seven motivational gifts. There's prophesying or prophecy, which is, and let me give you another word for that, perceiving, prophecy or perceiving or telling us the heart and the mind of God. There's ministering. Another word for ministering might be serving. 
serving. Uh, teaching is, is another motivational gift. Encouraging or exhorting is, is a fourth mo motivational gift. Giving, a fifth one. Leading or administration is a sixth one. And then, and then mercy is a seventh one. Uh, so uh, someone put it this way, and I, th I thought it was really good. Prophecy is the eyes for the body of Christ. It's the eye, it sees, it perceives. Serving is the hands of the body of Christ. And, and, and let me stop right here and, and say that, you know, you say, well, um, are you talking about using my gift in the church to serve the church? I, I am in a, in a way. Um, and, and you might say, well, you know, what can I do? There's ushering, there's, there's working the connection center, there's greeting at the door, uh, there's teaching uh, children's ministry, there's, there's youth ministry. What, what can I, I, I th those are all service. Those are all service uh, and teaching areas. And, and that's good to do. But there's only so many jobs in the church. How many of you know? Uh, if we were all ushers, think about it. <laughs> If, if we were all greeters, we, you couldn't get into church for the greeters, you know? So, so these are all positions in the church, but I'm talking, about, I'm talking about something greater than that. We all have a function in the church. We all have a function in the body of Christ. So uh, someone once said, prophecy is the eyes of the body of Christ. Service is the hands. Teaching is the mind. Giving are the arms of the body of Christ. Exhortation is the mouth of the body of Christ. Administration is the head or the leadership of the body of Christ. And mercy is, of course, the heart of the, of the body of Christ. Um, when, I was, when I was little, I, I loved to watch television. I, I was addicted to television when I was a little. Uh, because back in that day, televisions were about that big around. And I was, I was, I sat up just as close as I could. And uh, one of the, one of the, um, um, uh, just to show you how, how old I am, uh, one of the um, um, television shows was Pinky Lee. A anybody remember Pinky Lee? Yeah, I know you don't because I'm older than dirt. But <laughs> Pinky Lee was on television. I remember the theme song. Da -da, da -da, my name is Pinky Lee. Da -da -da -da, and a checkered hat and a checkered. Uh, no, 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 no. But I was addicted to TV. I watched it all the time. And I had heroes. Uh, Mighty Mouse. Hero. Um, Superman. Hero. And, and they, they, the Hulk. I loved. I, I mean, I, I, but nowadays, think about this. Many of our heroes have become combos of other, of other hero uh, other heroes. For example, there's the Avengers. Uh, there's the Guardians. There's the X-Men. There's the Fantastic Four. They're unstoppable. They're unstoppable. Why are they unstoppable? Because they're a unit together. Let, let me make a statement. I, I said all that to make this statement. The church is unstoppable when everyone functions in their gifting. You hear that? It's, un it's unstoppable. It's unstoppable. When everyone, well, pastor, I just believe that there's a calling upon my life to sit in the pew and do nothing. That's not one. I can't find that in the Bible. I looked for it. I really did look for it. I really did. Because when I first came to Word of Life, after pastoring for a while, and I was uh, working a courier job at the moment, and I had tried to retire from ministry, and I was sitting back there, and, and I told my wife, I said, honey, let's just, let's just go to Word of Life. I just want to sit. I just want to sit there. Nobody knows I'm here. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, ain't, that didn't last very long. <laughs> But you were not called just to, just, to, just to be an attender. You were called to be a participant. Now, like I said, not, we can't all be greeters. But can you be an encourager? Can you be a giver? Can you be someone that has mercy? See, the church needs people to discover their giftings 
function in that gifting so that the church, fear this, is complete. We are incomplete without you. Uh, you say, well, uh, wait a minute, uh, isn't that your job? I'm glad you asked that question. I'm really glad, because I really have an answer for you. It's not. My job and the pastor's job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? Encouraging, strengthening, speaking a word of, of, uh, that, that is from the Lord, giving, showing mercy. Um, the gifts are used and intended to motivate the body of Christ towards Christ-centeredness and Christ-likeness. When, we, when these gifts are unused, when these gifts are not being used, when, when, they're being, when they're being neglected, as it were, the church suffers. The church suffers. We actually do the body a disservice when we don't function or operate in the giftings that God's given us. We, do, we actually do the church a disservice when we're not using and neglecting the gifts that God's given us. Um, let me give an example. Um, let's say seven friends got together. Each of them had different gifts um, of the motivational gifts I've mentioned. They got, to get, they got together at a small dinner party. When they'd eaten dinner, the hostess was bringing out the dessert on a tray. And lo and behold, the tray tipped, the, dirt, the dessert spilled, some went on the table, some went on the floor. Oh, what a mess, what a mess. The prophet would say, that's what happens when you're not careful. Because he's going to tell you the truth. The, the, the server would say, oh, 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 let me help you with that. The teacher would say, now, the reason that fell is it was too heavy on one side and you needed to balance it. That's the teacher. The exhorter would say, you know, next time, let's have dessert on the, on the table with a meal. What do you say? The giver would say, hey, I'll be happy to buy dessert next time. The mercy person would say, hey, don't feel bad. It could happen to anybody. Do you see how this works? Now, you, you may be thinking, hmm, I know people with some of those gifts. I, I, know, I know people that have uh, uh, teaching, uh, uh, gifting. Um, you know, thank God for of our school teachers that love the Lord and are teaching our kids uh, uh, the right way and the, and the right things. Thank God. They, they, are, they are gifted in that. They're just gifted. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, I'm running out of time here, but nonetheless, I'll tell you anyway. Pastor Kurt and I go out to lunch a lot because we loved each other and because we love to eat. And, um, well, I should say he loves to eat. I just go with him. But um, we got to lunch. But inevitably, inevitably, now Pastor Kurt was a teacher for how many years, Pastor Kurt? 30, 33 to 35 years. He was a teacher. Inevitably, inevitably, when we go out to lunch or something, someone will come up to him and say, Mr. Mr. Detter, Mr. Detter, you remember me? I was one of your students. He made such an impact on those students that how long have you been retired? I can't figure that out. 20, 22 years? 20, 20, 22 years, and they still remember Mr. Detter. Isn't that amazing? Because he was he had a calling to be a teacher. You see what I mean? So um, uh, the, 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 those giftings, those, those callings, uh, they're, 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 they're wonderful. First Corinthians chapter 12, uh, just a, a couple of verse, verse 12, and then I'm going to jump to verse 21 and then to verse 25. Just as the human body is one, though it has many parts that together form one body, so too is Christ. We would be wrong for the, it would be wrong for the eye to say to the hand, I don't need you. 
No, it would be wrong. And equally wrong for the head to say to the foot, I don't need you. In fact, the weaker our parts, the more vital and essential they are. He has done this intentionally. Listen to this, for, this phrase. He, has done, he, God, has done that intentionally so that every member would look after the other with mutual concern. And so that there would be no division in the body. In that way, whatever happens to one member happens to all. If one suffers, everyone suffers. If one is honored, everyone rejoices. So the church is complete when we are exercising our giftings and helping each other in times of need. Now, how does this work? And I'm, I'm going to close with this. How did this work in the early church? Here's how it worked in the early church. Acts chapter 2. All the believers... All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer, and a deep sense of awe came over them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Now, you may think, well, that's finances. That's not only finances. That's everything they had. Their mercy, their compassion, their, their, their encouragement. They shared everything that they had with each other. And the church was blessed. They sold property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple every day, met, met in homes in, in, uh, for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Why was the early church so successful because they met each other's needs. I believe, I, you can't tell me tonight that there's people here that don't have any needs. There are. I've stopped asking people, how are you? Because here's what people say, I'm good. When they're not good. When they're not good. You got to go deeper than that. You got to say, no, really, really, how are you? I'm hurting. I've got loss in my life. I've got this, I've got that. Let me give you another scripture. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. And all the believers were united in heart and mind. They were united. And they felt that, they, that what they owned was not their own. So they shared Everything they had. And again, I don't believe that's just finances. I believe it's everything that they had. Their giftings, their talents, their abilities. They shared it. Think about this for a moment. I know I'm done. Think about this for a moment. What would the church be like if everyone in the church stewarded their talent and their ability to the, to, to, and used their gifting every time they came to church? Now, again, let me, let me just say that I'm not talking about shaking hands at the door. Listen, I, I work the coffee shop two, two Sundays a month. Allie allows me to work that. I thank God that she's a compassionate, loving, sensitive pastor's wife. That she allows me to work there. I, I said last, last time we were together, I bring no value to the coffee shop. I, can't, I couldn't make you a cup of coffee if I had to. And, 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 and that, that machine that puts out all of that, that, that caramel, whatever. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, yeah, that stuff. That's filled with sugar and you shouldn't be drinking it. But nonetheless, nonetheless, I don't know how to do any of that. But in the coffee shop, here's, I use my gifting. I'm an encourager. People come up and they're waiting on their coffee and I'm going, hey, how are you? How's things going? How's the kiddos? What, would you have a good week? No, good, that's wonderful. I, I encourage, and, and it makes your wait on your coffee seem like pff, nothing because you've got an encourager to encourage you there. You understand what I mean? Can you be an encourager? Yes. Can you show mercy? Yes. Can you, can you be a prophet? Yes. I've had people come up to me and, 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 and say, this, 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 this is what the word means. This is, what, this, this is the word. This is, this, is what God's, this is what God's doing. And it is. It's powerful. 
First Peter, let me close with this. How many closings did I do? I'm done. First Peter, chapter four, verse 10. This, I saved this to last. This will blow you away. Listen to this. First Peter 4, 10. God has given each of you, say me, a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Listen to the next phrase. Use them well to serve one another. Use them. Now, next week, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over some of these motivational gifts. I'm going to give you the, the characteristics of, of each gift. I'm, I'm, you're, go, you're going to know what your motivational gift is next week. You're going to know that. Uh, and I'm also going to give you some of the negative things you have to be careful of. Uh, because as, as an encourager, I, I, I want to encourage you all the time. Sometimes you need a prophet. Hmm? Um, sometimes you need Cindy Dempsey. <laughs> Get it right. Huh? It's true. It's true. Yeah, you do. And I, I, love, I love Cindy. Stand with me if you would, please. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Use your gift for the Lord. Use it for the Lord. And next week, we'll talk about these gifts and give you some understanding of them, some characteristics of them, and you're going to know what your spiritual gift is. But in the meantime, I spend some time in prayer asking God, what have you gifted me? What, what, what have you given me that, that, that I can help the body of Christ with? Uh, it's, it's powerful. Praise God.